so much, uh, Dr. Fleming, and um, everyone for being here. Um, I remember my days in um, seminary. Seems like the last chapel session is always the least attended. The chapel before the finals because um, everyone is thinking about their final exams and their projects and their research papers and. And even uh, those who are in chapel uh, during those uh, last sessions, they're sitting there with a study sheet, at least I know I did. Uh, I'm looking up and saying, amen, and I got my little study sheet right here, about five, and three by five or something, but don't let me see you doing that down there. Don't do as I do, right? <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, I'm really honored and thankful that you've taken the time to be here, and particularly thankful to my um, wonderful wife uh, 15 years uh, for standing by my side and um, my two little bundles of joy, my sweet potato pie, my pumpkin pie. <laughs> Look at them, they think they've all grown that up now, you know. Or, or they're saying that, that, I can't believe you said that in public. There's some things that apparently are supposed to be reserved for home only. Um, but I love them dearly and I'm thankful to the Lord um, for uh, bringing them into my life. Um, you guys here at um, Charlotte Christian are very special to me as well. Um, particularly this um, set of graduates um, here uh, for a number of reasons. Um, we've said it uh, many times. Um, this is, I, I believe, um, the first time when the entire class um, has been, um, I've had the opportunity to walk alongside with the entire graduating class. Um, for um, the entirety of their journey here, or most thereof, and I'm e extremely thankful to um, see them um, walk this path, and I'm um, sure many of you are saying, my time is just around the corner, and um, uh, to God be the glory. Sister Tina is over there, she just can't contain herself. <laughs> um, um, today, as I prayed and I thought about what to share, in this um, final um, chapel session with a group of students and uh, my colleagues, and, and certainly to myself as well. And so um, as I was praying and the Lord has dealt with my heart, I've arrived at um, what I'd like to call the topic today, um, living the Christian life with the end in view. <coughs> living the Christian life with the end in view. So here's the question. How then do we live the Christian life with the end in view. You've heard it said before, I'm sure, that apparently some of us can be of so have, can be so heavenly minded that we are of very little or no earthly good. Now, I don't think that statement is exactly true, even though I do understand um, what persons mean when they say that. I think what they intend to communicate is that some of us as Christians, we can walk around in, in, in such a manner as if we're in heaven that we'll just quit living here and quit witnessing here and quit serving the Lord here because we're just so focused on heaven. Well, if that's the way you're living, uh, I, I hate to break the news to you, but you're not uh, very uh, heavenly minded as you think you are. Truly, if we're going to be very uh, heavenly minded, we must simultaneously be of great earthly good. Because we cannot live with the end in view without ordering our path in such a manner that we know that it will be pleasing to the Lord. We can't be living in such a manner that we're so enthralled with the beauties of heaven, that which we know about heaven, so much so that we're simply saying, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus, to the point where we cease witnessing, uh, sharing the gospel with those who need to hear Christ. Because uh, of what purpose then is heaven if it's not to house those who come to faith in Christ? How then can we also be of such heavenly minded that we quit witnessing, that we quit sharing the gospel, that we quit living for Christ while here on earth? So the question that arises then is, how then can we live this Christian life with the end in view? I'd like to share with us today five ways in which we can do this. Now, I didn't say the five ways. 
I said I would like to share with us five ways in which we can do this. Um, that simply suggests that there are many other ways in which we can do this, um, but as I did business with the Holy Spirit, these are the five um, uh, principles that were um, brought to me. And so I have three texts um, today. Um, first is Hebrews chapter 12, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 3, reads, Therefore, since we also have a large crowd of witness surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that is so easily ensnare, that so easily ensnares us, and run with endurance the race that is that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy laid before him endured a cross perhaps should be the cross, uh, but nonetheless, endure, endure a cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. And then verse 3 says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the hour has come. We pray that you'll glorify yourself, glorify your Son, and uh, use your servant as you sp you've spoken to him. Now speak through him, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first principles we see here in Hebrews chapter 12, the first part of verse 1, is that uh, the first point here is run patiently. Or perhaps I could say live patiently. So how then do we live this Christian life with the end in view? We live or run the Christian race patiently. We're told, therefore, since we also have surrounded us, if you may, a huge, a large crowd, innumerable crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that lies ahead of us. So then how do we live? We live this Christian life patiently. Trying of our faith, the trying of our faith, James tells us in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, that the trying of our faith produces patience. It therefore means that if we're going to run this Christian race, if we're going to live this Christian life with patience, it simply means, or if we even pray and ask God for patience. Anyone here has ever asked God for patience? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, it can be a very dangerous prayer. Uh, because in order to, to improve upon our faith, it simply means that God must then take us through the valleys and shadows of death. Now, I'm not saying that we don't pray that prayer. I'm simply saying, be careful of the prayers that we pray. And then when we begin to pray that prayer and we see some things start happening in our lives, don't lose heart. And that's why we're told that we run with endurance. All right? And we know that the devil is trying to trip us up. All right? We're told here that there, is, that there is sin that tries to ensnare us. It's almost like, you remember back in the days, or perhaps you didn't do this, because you know some of you guys were just so perfect, and, and I probably, I hesitate to share this with my children here, because uh, I think I'm going to hear it again. But you know, as kids, you know, you're walking into school or something, and and uh, you see someone coming, they're walking in a line or a queue, uh, a queue or whatever it is, and, and uh, they probably are not paying attention, and you just kind of, just like James is doing right there, you know, just stick your foot out in the way, and uh, some unsuspecting person, they're coming around the corner, and they oh, and they trip right over it. Or one of my favorite things to do with the family when we do our family evenings is to watch um, America's Funniest Videos. And I'm not promoting that or, or the, the TV station that brings it, but uh, I mean, I just like a good laugh. If you've had around me for any uh, period of time, you'll, you'll know that. I just love a good laugh, right, right Tiffany? Uh-huh. 
Mm-hmm. I love a good laugh. And uh, my family will tell you we go around the house scaring each other um, all the time. We don't scare mom because I just, you know, I'm not, I just, I'm not prepared for what might happen. So we just stay away from that. And uh, the kids and I, we play that game all the time. But, you know, one of the favorite things that I see on America's Funniest Videos is when someone takes, you know, selfie wrap and just cover a doorway and some dude just wakes up out of bed or they call someone to come quickly and they come running around the corner and because of the transparency of the plastic, uh, they feel it in your faces before they actually see it. All right, so, uh, but, but, but we know that the devil will use various circumstances, uh, sin if we may, to trap us, to ensnare us, and we're told that we are, even in such circumstances, we ought to run this race with Patience. So again, how do we live this Christian life with the end in view? We run or live patiently. That's number one. Number two, we run or live fervently. That is passionately, um, enthusiastically, um, energetically, joyfully. We're told here in, in verse uh, second part of verse two, um, uh, that uh, uh, for the perfect of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne on high. There was a manner in which he lived his life regardless of the suffering that he encountered. He could live the life with such just passion. He could walk. We remember in Philippians chapter um, 2, we are told, hey, let this mind be in you as was also in Christ Jesus, who even though he existed in the very form, the morphe of God, he didn't consider that anything to, to hold so tightly to like a vice grip. But he so willingly, so passionately, he gave this up Lay it aside for a period of time, and when you do theology, your, your professors will explain what it means to lay aside, and you'll find out it's quite the anomaly as to what you and I may have originally thought it means to lay aside. Of course, one of the views in the laying aside is that Jesus abandoned some of his deity. I don't think that's the position, the accurate position on that particular text. But again, what it really means, I think, defies our mathematics because we would think. One, take away one, equals zero. But when Jesus laid something aside, he actually took something else on. He being in the form of God in a state with one nature in his divineness, in his godness, he laid aside by taking on humanity, so now he exists as the God-man, 100% God, and also 100% man. And so for that reason, we could hear him say, you know, no one knows the day or the time when the Lord shall return. And, and those who read that would say, hey, well, I mean, isn't he the Lord? Is he not speaking about himself? How could he not know the day when he will return? Well, the idea is, in his humanness alone, that was not known. But certainly, as God, and I don't think we can really uh, compartmentalize those um, totally, uh, but certainly there are times when he speaks uh, from the pain and agony that he felt as a human being and, and hunger as he felt as a human being, which we know that God cannot feel that. And so there are times when there is a division there. And uh, nevertheless, he, he ran, he lived with such compassion. He lived with such joy. Why? There was something that was set before him. You ever been to maybe the state fair? And, uh, you know, when, when we were growing up in Jamaica, we didn't have these things. And, and we see on TV programs just dogs chasing around in a ring like they were racing. And, and we thought, really? I didn't know dogs could do that. There must be some super dogs they have in America. I mean, how would they do that? And, but then when you look at these things, you realize what they don't show you is this bone that they dangle in front of the dog and it keeps it moving on the string. And so the dog is actually chasing the bone, but you know, they just don't show that in all the programs. Uh, 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 so, so the dog could run with such fervor 
Why? Because he's trying to catch this thing that would somehow satisfy him or bring him a measure of joy. And so he chased after that. If you and I would run this race in such a manner, knowing that there is something that is laid up for you and laid up for me, then I think it would increase the level of our joy and our fervor regardless of what we must endure in this life. We are then living this Christian life with the end in view. Not only do we run patiently and we run fervently, but we also run enduringly. We're told a couple of times here in chapter, in verse 2, that we are enduring. Jesus also endured, so we also must endure ourselves. What are we enduring and why are we enduring? Jesus, he endured the cross, despising the shame. We're also told, for consider him who endured the hostility of sinners against himself, so that you won't grow weary. So one of the reasons why we must endure is in order not to become weary on life's journey. I mean, who doesn't know that the Christian journey can become so burdensome at times that we become weary? Yes, the scripture reminds us not to become weary in the good that we do. But I think John Stott, the late John Stott, he said it right. He says that the, um, the, 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 the storms of life, as he calls it, it can do one or, or two things, two things to us, and we get to choose. Number one, he says, it can drive us away from God if we allow it, or these storms of life can drive us towards God. And then he says, you choose. What then do we choose? Do we choose to allow the uncertainties of life? Do we choose to allow the, the challenges of life, the burdens of life, the, the insecurities that we all encounter at times to throw us off course, so to speak, to allow us to become weary in our journey? Let us not forget that an athlete cannot afford to become weary in this race. A an athlete must spend some time in training. And we're told here in verse 1 of chapter 12 that, that, that we must lay aside all the weight that would hold us back from attaining this crown or from running this race in such a manner that would allow us to attain the joy at the end. Athletes also, they spend time training. There are times when they will train with weights on their feet so that they can run as fast as they possibly can with the weights. But then when the Olympics comes around, they don't go out there with the weights on their feet. They take them off at that particular point so that they can run as fast or maybe nearly as fast as uh, Hussein Bolt. <laughs> but, but we run with endurance, endurantly if you may. Because you see, the, the athlete who quits midway the race because he or she uh, 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 has become overburdened or think this is too much or the race is too long or just because they're all the way at the back, they never usually complete the race. And certainly if they walk across the finishing line, uh, they're, they're never usually uh, coming in first and winning the gold medal. But the one who wins the gold medal are often those who pursue and continue to do so until they get across the finish line. Now I know just um, over the weekend, I don't remember what program, I don't even remember the name of the athletes or, or what was the situation, um, but somehow some TV station was showing, it might have been in America's Funniest Video, come to think of it, yes it was actually, see how much time I do spend watching these silly programs. Um, but they showed this race, I don't, remember, don't know how long it was, I just turned the television on. They showed this race with this guy, um, he, was, he was just way ahead of everyone. And he had slowed down and began to do like this with his hand to the crowd, trying to tell everybody to get up and cheer for him. But what he wasn't doing was to look behind him to see who was coming. And while he was doing this, and he was doing this with this hand and looking that way, here comes this guy and passes him. And just as the guy was nodding over the finish line, that's when he noticed, but then it was too late. He had forfeited the goal. Why? Because he stopped short of the finish line to celebrate. 
You and I cannot afford to stop short of the finish line to celebrate. We must continue to run until the very end. Our graduates, for instance, they didn't stop short to celebrate. I'm sure discouragement came along the way, uh, generally during our final exam or midterm exam time. We all usually get discouraged, don't we, Ms. Burke? <laughs> We get discouraged, but uh, we don't allow that discouragement to prevent us from finishing the course, don't we? Uh, or those who do allow that to happen, they don't experience the joy of graduation, or they have to retake that class, go through the very same thing again, pay more money, and all that sort of stuff. But again, for us, we run patiently. We run fervently. We run enduringly. And number four, we run consistently. We run consistently. Look at J, um, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here is Paul at the conclusion of his life. He knew for sure that this imprisonment, he would not be released from this imprisonment. And as he wrote to encourage young Timothy and, and others, and, yourself and mine included, me included. Listen what he says in verse, um, uh, first of all, let's go to verse 1. He says here, uh, before God and Christ Jesus, who is going to, uh, let's, go, let's go to verse 2 just for the sake of time, because this is where, really where the point of consistency is. It says to proclaim the message, or some of your versions say, preach the gospel in season and out of season. My version says, Proclaim the message, um, persist in it whether, whether uh, convenient or not. Rebuke, correct, and encourage, and um, with great patience, here goes the word patience again, and teach it. Again, I, I prefer the King James on this to um, preach the gospel in season and out of season. Paul encouraged Timothy. You, you would think Paul is facing certainly his death. You would think perhaps he would be there, you know, having a little, you know, a little pity party. Woe is me. How could God, whom I'm serving, allow all of this to happen to me? No, instead, he sought to use whatever was left of his life to encourage Timothy and you and me today. Later on, he reminds us, and we'll get to that later as we conclude, but again, uh, as we be consistent, what we mean here is to, to remain faithful to the Lord in all matters. What has God called you to? What, what is the area of your calling? Is it to pastor? Is it to work with youth? Is it to work with children? Is it to be a missionary? Uh, is it to be a church planter? Is it to, to serve in your community in some capacity? Understand to what God has called you and faithfully pursue that, consistently pursue that, and preach the gospel in season and out of season. But also be consistent in the, in, the, in the living of the gospel. Oftentimes, some of us might find it easy to preach the gospel whenever we have the occasion and some platform. And we would stand there and we would just wax eloquently um, before others. And, and uh, perhaps those of us who would do personal evangelism, who would take those opportunities to share the gospel uh, with persons along the way, or neighbors, those within our, in our, um, uh, our workplaces, and so on and so forth. But as much as that is important, Christ encouraged us as well to live the gospel. How do we live the gospel, and how would that be somewhat dissimilar to the preaching, the verbal proclamation of the gospel? Well, we're using our lives as that living testimony. Being careful of where we go, what we say, what we do, how we say it, how we do it. Making sure that we are shining the spotlight on Christ. We're promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ in every opportunity that presents itself. In our prayer lives, when we're with people who want, don't care to hear us pray or not, we're consistently living the gospel. So much so that those who are so hardened against the gospel, the word of God, when they arrive at some crisis in their lives, to whom will they turn? If you are not living the gospel, 
If your neighbors don't know that you are a believer, simply because you come home, you mash your garage door button and you drive right in, you park your car, you go in your home, you do whatever you do, you come right back out and you go about your business. If that's all you do in the community, I suggest that you might not be living the gospel as you ought to. Yes, you might be living the gospel among those within the four walls of your home, but what about your neighbors? Who knows Christ? Your neighbor to your left, your neighbor to your right, do they know Christ? Your neighbor across the street from you, do they know Christ? Who are they? And how are you going about sharing the gospel, living the gospel? So and so, again, that if they themselves are in a crisis, that they'll come to you. You know, I was talking with one young lady recently who spoke about uh, some fire in um, uh, 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 next door, um, their, her, her home, and, um, uh, and the, the neighbors came to them for help and for shelter, not just because they were neighbors, but just because they knew that their neighbors are believers in Christ. And regardless of them not being believers, they knew who to turn to, who would uh, provide them some <coughs> shelter, and who would be really patient with them. Do so consistently. Recently, I had an opportunity of um, speaking with a young man who's a very good uh, friend uh, of mine, and my family, actually. I try to be very vague. But uh, I remember talking with him about a challenge that he was having in his home, and, and he was ready to pack it up and call it quits. In fact, he had begun just when things got so you know, difficult at home, he would just leave and you know, spend a couple of nights or, or, or away from the family at a hotel. And uh, he was telling me how tired he was of this marriage and this you know, wife, that he's just ready to pack it up and just walk away. But why would he just give up at that particular point? What was happening? How could he make this as a, a sacrifice to, to God? Which is what I spoke to him about. I said, you know, brother, I, I hear you. I, I can imagine how painful that is, and it would certainly be painful for me as well. But I said to him, you know, but your kids need you. Your community needs you. The church needs you. Your wife needs you. God needs you. And, 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 and the church doesn't need to, to hear or to know of one more person who calls it quit and walk away from his or her family. Hang in there. Be consistent in our love. Be consistent in the sharing of the gospel, in the living of the gospel. Be patient even with those within our homes. And I know how difficult that can be sometimes. And my family knows how difficult it can be just living with me. But again, if we're going to live this Christian life with the, with the end in view, again, we must run patiently. We must run fervently. We must run enduringly. We must run consistently. And then finally, we must run expectantly. Uh, back to 2 Timothy chapter 4, 7 and 8. This is how Paul concludes this section of encouragement to Timothy and us. He says, I have fought the good fight. What a statement. This is one reason why we endure. This is one reason why we don't give up. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I wonder how many of us will be able to say that. I wonder when we draw our very last breath should the Lord tarry? I wonder if we will be able to say on our dying bed, yes, I have fought the good fight. I remain patient, fervent. Oh, yes, I endured. I was consistent in my walk. But not only that, he says, I have finished the race. Some versions would say, finish the course. Notice, here, we're not talking about who came in first, or who came in second, or who came third, or fourth, or fifth, or who even came in last. Who cares? Paul says, I have finished the race. There are times in your life 
when you just don't need to be competing with anybody else. Just set your focus on finishing the race. There are times when students come and they have all sorts of challenges in the class and I would say to them, just endure and finish the class and make a passing grade. You know, we all know it as instructors because we were there as students as well. There are some classes that we would come to and say, uh-uh, boy, if I had to make an A in this class, yeah, I don't think I can make it. And then we come to some classes that we say, you know what, I don't think I can make an A in that. I think I'll settle for a B. That class, ah, that's an easy A. That's why I hear a lot of students say about my classes. <laughs> well, that's not true. <laughs> uh, but uh, I said, I can make an easy A on that, or I'm going to do a B on this, or I'm going to do a C on this. I made a commitment to the Lord some time ago that I would rather fail a class, academic work, make a B, a C, or a D, fail there if and if, if I had to, as long as I am passing at home and in my relationship with Christ. And I think to myself, which is more important? I understand academics, particularly for those who want to move on to um, um, uh, higher uh, um, degrees. I, I do understand it. I get it. I'm not discouraging you from doing all you can to earn those A's. But what if you have earned those A's? Straight A student on your academics and you look at your transcript and you say you have something about which you can boast. But yet still, when you look within your home, when you look within your own personal life, you know it's a wreck, and you know you're failing there. Choose to pass where God is concerned and fail anywhere else. Paul says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I have kept the faith. This is my prayer. Because it's not necessarily how we start the race. It's really how we complete the race. And here at Charlotte Christian College and Seminary, we as faculty and staff, we desire to see every single student finish the race by accomplishing what they came here to accomplish, to complete and graduate with that degree. We earnestly desire that. We know not everyone will. We, we've seen, we, we understand, we, we see what history um, has brought us. But even if we fail in that regard, let us not fail in our walk with Christ. Let us live this Christian life with the end in view. What end? Look at verse 8. Paul continues. In the future, or in the end, some versions would say, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Notice how definitively he is speaking here. This is not an if or maybe. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Therefore, I know there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give unto me on that day, not only me, but to all those who shall love his appearing. Are you, do you find yourself on that continuum? Do you find yourself in that bracket of those who are running with the end in view? Making sure that you're keeping the faith? Making sure that you're fighting the good fight? Knowing that we cannot fight this fight on our own? Knowing that we can only do so successfully with Christ on our side? By the way, it even gets better. Just so one of the things that helps me along my journey, particularly in those difficult times, is to remind myself that Christ has already won the victory for me on the cross. And that absolutely nothing or no one can separate me from the love of God. Paul reminds us in Romans 8, not things present, nor things to come, nor things past, nor height, nor death, nor principalities, or powers. Absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. We are therefore more than conquerors through Him who loves us and purchased us with his precious blood. So therefore, our end, our victory is secure. 
All we need to do is to run this race patiently, fervently, enduringly, consistently, and expectantly. Looking unto Jesus, where we began in Hebrews, the author and the finisher of our faith. It doesn't matter what comes our way. We remain firmly planted in Jesus Christ. John reminds us in John chapter 10 that we are so secure that we're in Jesus' hands and he's in the Father's hands. That's what we call in Jamaica Rambo style security. <laughs> Absolutely no one can snatch us out of his hands. We are secure for all eternity. Why? For we have not been redeemed by silver or gold, but we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's run the race. Let's finish the course. Let's do so with our eyes fixed on Jesus and all the other things of which you have need, as we're reminded in Matthew chapter 6. Seek ye first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all the things of which you have need, he shall provide. Take care of God's business first, and he'll take care of yours. As you prepare for your exams, as you work on those papers, honor the Lord. I can't tell you how much it breaks my heart and, and those of other faculty and staff when, when we have to read or deal with students who have chosen to take a shortcut. Why? Because we've taken our eyes off the Lord and we've just placed it on that grade that we want to have for that course. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Seek after what I call the necklace. Don't worry about the pendant. The pendant is like the grades. The pendant is like the degrees or the degree that you will have, the diploma that you will receive, some of you just a few weeks, others of you a few months. Keep your eyes on the prize, the necklace. All the other stuff, the pendants that will come, God will bring it as long as you keep your eyes on Him as your prize. How then do we live? With the end in view, we live patiently, enduringly. I'm missing one, but um, uh, consistently and expectantly and earnestly. I forget that one. So let's fervently rather live this Christian life, run this race, so that in the end you too can say like Paul, I've honored the Lord in my walk, in my time here at Charlotte Christian, and in that ministry to which God has called me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today, for this week, for this month, for this semester. We know, Lord, that we've not always walked patiently, fervently, enduringly, consistently, or even expectantly. Sometimes, Lord, we've gotten our eyes off the price. We've become concerned about our personal needs and we begin to look at the Joneses and what they have and what they're doing and the measure of success they seem to be having. So much so that we spend more time looking at them instead of onto Jesus. But Lord, as the old hymn writer reminds us, help us, Lord, also to turn our eyes upon Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So I commit these students to you, those gathered here today, and those who are not for one reason or the other. Help them, Lord, to so live and to honor you every step of the journey. Dismiss us now with your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.